All right, welcome everyone. So um, it's a real pleasure today. We have a, a very special session. Um, Gary and Judy Olson will be our speakers, and who um, many or most of you know have been a very um, kind of a strong founding or guiding uh, presence in this department over the past. Uh, so I, I should have how you said ten years. Or yeah. yeah. um, I should say, um, and, and a lot of at least from speaking for myself, my uh, interest in coming here a couple of years ago was getting to know them. And I, I should say there was a, a really interesting podcast I'd heard. I may have mentioned this to Judy about um, two years ago. She was talking with some people about careers in academics and academic departments and, and what kind of what it means to be collegial. And I, I heard how she was talking about this and thought, oh my god, this is, this is absolutely a place I want to be at. Um, just the way that you can think about growing an intellectual community, asking genuine questions, but still being decent to people. <laughs> Which I think is a large part of, of what they exude. Um, they've won uh, virtually um, every award I think that is that is known of. I don't have your CV in front of me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sure you'll go over it, but it's a real uh, thrill and honor to have them here. So thank you so much for being willing to talk with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what's kind of funny about this talk is it's kind of an extended introduction because we're going to try to cover our careers. Um, and indeed, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about everything from the beginning of our careers up until now, and then uh, kind of look at how it's tangled up with other things. In particular, um, we'll kind of talk about four different kinds of things. One is, of course, the, our career, the trajectories where we came from, the various twists and turns it had, and it had a lot of twists and turns. Um, we've done two kinds of research. Um, we were trained as experimental cognitive psychologists, so conducting experiments is kind of in our blood, but we learned very early on that you can't just be uh, a monolingual person in this field. So we've done lots of other kinds of work as well. Uh, in particular, a lot of field work of various kinds, and we'll explain that a little bit more. And then we're going to weave in, as we go through our history, kind of what's going on in the field. Uh, because uh, uh, actually people in this room we've intersected with a number of times in the past, and um, it's, you know, we've, we've been involved not only in our own research, but also in the field itself in ways that we'll explain as we go along. So, um, my beginnings are, I got a PhD from Stanford in experimental cognitive psychology. Technically, I was in the mathematical psychology program, but I kind of bailed out of that and moved into the more cognitive uh, stuff. When I finished my degree in 1970, it was in the middle of the Vietnam War, and uh, the, uh, faced the issue of what I was going to do, and I ended up through a variety of twists and turns in the Navy as an officer conducting human factors research in the submarine base in New London, Connecticut. Uh, and that was kind of interesting because it's probably where I first really saw that stuff I had learned in graduate school in psychology was relevant to stuff in the world. So we were doing research on diving and on submarine operations and so on, and I was applying what I had learned in various ways, and that was kind of, that's the kind of thing where I picked up the interest in doing kind of a more applied work. In 1973, when I, read, when I finished in the Navy, I uh, got an academic job at Michigan State and uh, in a psychology department. And I thought I was going to be there for quite a while. But in my second year there, several universities came chasing, including the University of Michigan. Uh, Judy was, at the time, the chairperson of the search committee. We weren't a couple. <laughs> <laughs> So I only spent two years at Michigan State, and in 1975 moved to the University of Michigan. Okay, so I got my PhD at University of Michigan, also in experimental psychology, also in cognitive, also was part of the math psych learning <laughs> program, but just, you know, parallel somewhere else. Um, but after I graduated, I went to Stanford for a postdoc, um, working with Gordon Bauer, who turned out to be his advisor. Um, I continued working on learning and memory and uh, problem solving and got into the whole idea about who's problem solving all the time. It turned out to be computer programmers. All right, you, have to, you have this goal and you have this stuff that you have to make to actually do that goal. And then debugging and things like that. And we'll go over some of that in a minute. So I did hear, no, 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 no. Those. <laughs> Put your hands off that. <laughs> um, then I came back to the University of Michigan. It turned out while I was a graduate student, I married a professor, and so I was a spousal hire. Right? 
did pretty well after that, but you know, I was still a <laughs> liar. Um, also, I had just the best of all uh, department chairs because, no, no slight, Andre, but um, I was uh, raising a family, producing babies, raising a family, and he, every semester, just said, so what proportion do you want to work? Do you want half time or three quarter time, whatever? And that we'll just accrue all of those times until we get to your sixth or seventh work time, and then we'll put you up for tenure. That's an amazing program. He just made it up and thought that was reasonable. And, you know, it went on. So I worked part time. Oh, you like that one? <laughs> So I worked part-time, but after six calendar years, I was put up for tenure and I got it. So there was no sort of brouhaha about my being late. Um, yes, now we can go. So this is what we looked like back then. Big glasses. Yeah, the glasses that came down here. That was the style that was all in. <laughs> and then for me, I have to point this out. So I have this you know, very professional blazer on, and then a little feminine little tie, a right? little bony <laughs> thing that comes down. And I had the big glasses, and I will not comment about the haircut. Right, we'll just leave that one behind. All right, at the time, there were, no, there were no personal computers, there was no internet. This is way back when the only people who touched computers were computer programmers. And indeed, when we had a program to run, we put it on cards, and we took it to the computer center, gave it to them in a package, and then we got our results the next morning. And sometimes one little format error suddenly said, you know, I got 87 pages of one word per page. Oops, that's not quite right. I better change that. So the cycles are much slower than they are today. Um, so the end users were programmers. We didn't have the internet, but we did have the ARPANET. This is back in the 60s and 70s. So the Advanced Research Projects Agency had an internet, not sorry, a network that went to major universities. Around. So we did have email back then, uh, with email addresses about this long, because you had to put in the entire route about how it was going to go. Um, and we had not standalone computers, but our computers were just terminals connected directly to the computer, and then you had your time on the computer, and then time not. Uh, but there are two major events that happened in the 1960s. Um, one is, and I'll tell you about those in a minute, the first is Douglas Engelbart's The Mother of All Demos. How many people know The Mother of All Demos? Oh, I get to tell a lot of people about it. Okay, <laughs> terrific. It's usually everybody knows this one. All right, and then in 1972, we have Xerox Park opens, and they produced the first personal computer. But let me show, what, show you what it looks like. So this is The Mother of All Demos. It's Doug Engelbart. We had terminals like the ones on the left. All right, it was green screen. It was green letters on black just rows and rows and rows, and when it wanted you to do something, it had a dot on the screen, and, and basically it was saying, okay, guess what I can do? Right? And oh, not that, not that, no, I can't do that. <laughs> you have to keep guessing. No drop-down menus, no nothing, right? So W. Bart then gives a big demo of what you could do in the future with computers, and the first thing he puts up is a graphical user interface. He didn't have a little windows, but he did have you know, points on the, on the space, and you could draw from one to the other. And you notice not only a keyboard, but on the right, a mouse, which is a very thick, almost like a, a cigarette package, but double, with three buttons on the top, right, which indicated very diff different kinds of actions. And then on the left was a joystick. And so you could draw, and then you could drive, and you could do all kinds of things. 1968, 50 years ago. By the way, the videos of that demo are like accessible on the web, so if you would like to revisit that demo, you can do that. Right. And this is the Alto, one of the very first personal computers. Uh, what do you notice that's different? This way, like a piece of paper, right, instead of this way. Um, but all the windows and the drop-down menus and all that kind of stuff that we're used to today was invented way back in uh, actually 1973. So moving into the 1980s, um, uh, we were both at Michigan, well I was at Michigan, uh, uh, but Judy had a little side trip. <laughs> side trip. So my husband at the time wanted to leave Michigan and so he got a job at NYU in New York and so I had a big area in which I could choose what kind of job I wanted. But I got a job right away at, at Bell Labs, not the research area, but down in 
uh, software engineering, so where they're actually building stuff. And in a group of 250 software engineers, I was the lone person going to do UX. But the manager said to me, put his hands on my shoulders, he said, you will grow into a department. Right, that's your job, not just to do the work, but then generate enough people to do the work that we needed in, in the department. And three years later, we had 22 people, all PhDs in psychology, because there was no HCI program back then. And uh, we were doing user experience and sort of inventing it as we went, right, about what methods we're going to use, when is it OK, we're running user studies all over the place, but then how good is good enough? All of those things we were sort of inventing internally. Um, ourselves. All right, and then I came back to the Michigan Business School. Uh, luckily, there was a job opening in the computer and information systems, and in that department was a person named Marilyn Manti, who was down Marilyn Tremaine, who was one of the inventors of the whole Chi community. And our department, that department, decided they didn't want just to have one person in a particular sub area of CIS, they wanted two. And since I was available and she was a big proponent of my work, then I got to be in the CIS department. And one of the reasons she was available is because we got married <laughs> in 1983. Yeah, and the smiles tell it all. <laughs> okay, in 1983, when Judy came back to Michigan and we were married, and uh, we, in the fall of 83, taught the very first human computer interaction course at Michigan, along with Marilyn Manti and Paul Green. Uh, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, we also launched a, a, a talk series in human-computer interaction. And the uh, first year, we brought in Stu Card, Alan Newell, Jack Carroll, Tom Moran, and Bill Curtis, which are, were all people who were big names at the time. Still big names, I guess. Well, and um, Alan Newell actually got the Turing Award, which is the highest award in ACM like, ever. And now it's actually worth a million dollars. It's a nice, nice pocket that goes along with that. So in the mid-80s, actually 1983, the book The Psychology of Human-Computer Interaction came out. It was actually Stu Card's dissertation, and Tom Moran and Alan Newell were on his committee. But this was a, a monumental breakthrough in HCI because what Stu did is rifle through all of the psychology that he knew, from perception to motor movement to decision making to, he took everything. Psychologists will study one little piece of it, right, to get it all right, but he wanted to know how do people behave. And so he put all these parameters together, and then on the right hand side is, we affectionately call him Bubblehead, um, is the parameters for some of these major things about how long does it take you to see something? How long does it take you to recognize it? How long does it take it for your eye to move to a new place? How long does it take you to recognize and uh, know what to do next from all the choices you have? And then how do you enact it? So things like Fitz Law. So all of these things had parameters. And so for any particular interface, you could figure out how long will this task take? And you can program what's going on in the head about what decisions you're making that the person is making. For example, I could do a shortcut or I could just type the whole thing out. Today, for example, how many of you are using Gmail where it completes your sentence for you? All right, so you see that. You, I just keep typing and I type exactly what's on the screen. Because to stop and then hit the tab key is just so foreign to me, it takes much longer. Right, so that's the trade-off we have here. So God, the uh, whole theory is called GOMS for goals, operators, methods, and selection rules. And that was the only way it was pronounced. All right, it could have been smog, but that didn't, didn't go, or smog, something like that. But it's GOMS, right, is the programming of all of that. Okay. And so I was doing a lot of work in extending the parameters of GOMS to see what other things were in choice making and different kinds of motor movements, things like that. And I uh, taught class, I uh, taught GOMS in class, one of the exercises. And this is the lesson and you never know who's in your class. So there's a book written by uh, Walter Isaacson called The Innovators. And this is a section where they're talking about Larry Page. The college course that made the greatest influence on me, a page said, was one in human-computer interaction taught by Judith Olson. 
So the goal was to understand how to design interfaces that were easy and intuitive. He, he was to analyze an action using GOMS and then test how long it took real people to do that. And so he chose to endure a male client, estimating and then testing how long it would take to perform various tasks. He discovered, for example, that a command keys actually slowed people down by nine tenths of a second compared to using a mouse. And he thought that was totally bogus, and then he tested people and it was 0.9 seconds, right? Just exactly what the model said. I feel like I developed an intuition of how people will interact with a screen, and I realized those things were pretty important. So he went to Human Computer Interaction Group at Stanford for a PhD. He, did, he dropped out to invent Google. That's pretty good. Uh, and it had been the subject of his favorite course at Michigan. He became an adherent of the concept of user design. So up here, the picture on the left is Larry Page in my class. Because every class, I take a picture of every student so that I can remember their names after a while. And I went to my archive, and there <laughs> he is. And then on the right-hand side, uh, uh, Larry went to um, work with Terry Weymouth at Stanford. Terry Winograd. Winograd. I'm doing that one. Uh, Terry Winograd. And this is Terry Winograd's retirement party. And everybody's going, is Larry going to show up? Is Larry going to show up? And he did. And he said some nice words about Terry. And then he mingled with the crowd. And then uh, we got a picture. He came over and he said, yeah, yeah, I liked your class. <laughs> <laughs> and so Gary snapped a picture of him putting his arm around me. OK, so this was kind of an important period in the field, uh, early 80s, because uh, we sort of, that's where we kind of got organized as a field in a, in a discipline. In 1982, there was a small conference in Gaithersburg, Maryland, kind of a pre-CHI conference. It was mostly attended by psychologists and computer scientists. That, of course, changed later. Um, and uh, that led to, in 1983, the very first CHI conference, uh, which, as you know, has been become the annual flagship conference for the field of human-computer interaction and meets, has met annually since 1985. Another kind of landmark uh, moment was in 1984, IBM, a large corporation, created an actual HCI laboratory with Jack Carroll as uh, in charge. Um, this is a picture from CHI 85 in San Francisco. It's uh, Sarah Bly, uh, Sylvia Shepard, Bill Curtis, Ducard, and uh, Alan Newell again. And uh, then there's this kind of this goofy guy. Um, this is not the only picture of him doing this. <laughs> um, this happens to be Doug Engelbart in the background there. And uh, this is Gerhard Fischer, who's also another early HCI person, and then a kind of goofy guy in the middle. So also, 1986 was the first computer-supported cooperative work conference. And originally, it was every other year. But after a couple of years of that, we realized that there were so many papers, so much interest in this, that the chair of the executive committee of the CSCW, Kevin V. Gary, uh, decided to have it every year. And it's been every year ever since. How many people go to the CSCW? A few. OK. Oh, some. Good, good, good. At that same time, uh, the first journal in HCI, called the HCI Journal, uh, was invented. Um, Tom Moran was the original editor. I was one of the people on the editorial board, and it turns out I've lasted 30 years on that board. Finally, I said, I think that's probably enough for that, reviewing every year for that. But also, there was the National Research Council put together a committee on human factors that had been, have, that had been around for quite a while. But now it's very much centered on HCI. Uh, the person who ran that is Dick Pugh, uh, who was originally at Michigan and then at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, which is a research outfit in Boston. Um, so this Committee on Human Factors has been going for a while. I served on it for 10 years. Uh, that's me in the, giving a talk in the background. And I like this because people seem to be taking notes. Say, okay. Or it could be their, you know, grocery list or whatever. <laughs> also, there was a big shift in HCI in the middle, uh, in nineteen mid-eighties. Mid-eighties. Okay. Lucy Suchman wrote a book called Plans and Situated Action, and it was written to counter the whole idea of GOMS. GOMS wasn't built to say this is how everything works in our behavior. 
But Lucy pointed out that we're not programmed to do just the thing we're looking at. We have some long-term goals and we have some capabilities and things trigger an action and we will go off and do that and solve another problem along the way. So situated actions, right? there's where you are and what your long-term goals are, are, is the way to act, understand behavior. But the, the challenge here then was this took a whole new set of methods. She's an anthropologist and so we did ethnography and field work as opposed to lab studies. All right, so this was the big shift in the field. Also in the 1980s, we created something that has had a long life, the Human Computer Interaction Consortium, and we call it, call it the anti-CHI, because when CHI was set up, uh, as many of the ACM conferences in our field anyway, um, the, the mode was to have short presentations, 20-minute talks, although even over time that has shrunk, and brief discussions with a few questions and so on. And we thought we really need a venue where we can get into something in some detail. So we, a group of us met at the old Denver airport uh, and uh, had, a, had a, decided we would form this consortium, the Human Computer Interaction Consortium. It's an organization of organizations. So a university joins it, a company joins it, a government agency joins it, and so on. And uh, initially we had a whole, whole program of activities, but the only one that's ever persisted is our summer, our annual workshop. So we have a workshop where we, we have usually a theme of some kind, uh, and the talks are 45 minutes long, and there's 45 minutes of discussion. So you really kind of get into something. And, it's and like, a discussant, somebody yeah, who's got somebody to stand up there discussion. and say things about what just said. The first few years that we met, we rotated among universities, but that turned out to be a disaster, because whatever university we met at, the people from that university hardly ever came to the session. They were too busy. So we decided we'd be better off meeting in remote places, so for the first number of years, we met in Colorado, up in Winter Park, Colorado. And uh, then as we grew and, and hit, kind of st were stretching the facilities in Winter Park, we looked for an alternative. Uh, initially, we met at Asilomar, which is in Monterey, California. The, they um, uh, kind of charged the algae bus price-wise, so we moved more recently to Pajaro Dunes, where we still meet. Uh, this organization still exists, and uh, we're actually meeting the end of June uh, this year, the topic is the future of work, and I know Gloria Mark is one of the featured speakers in the, on, the, on the topic. Um, my role was I became the chair of the organization for about 25 years, so I had a lot to do with kind of organizing it and keeping it going, although there were a lot of other people who helped. So following the model of Lucy Suchman, we started doing a lot of field work. Originally, Gary was doing a lot of work in team science, and I was doing a lot of work in the corporations because I was part of the business school, and the corporation said, oh, come and study us. So they actually opened doors for us to be able to go in, and you'll see later on how important that was. This is a Ford Motor Company in Bordeaux, France, and they did a lot of long-distance communication, and they were having trouble with it. So I was working closely with Stephanie Teasley, and she would therefore be in Dearborn, and I would be in France, watching the same meeting. So you see very different dynamics about people who are, for example, not on the screen, right? And who's coming and going, things like that, who's whispering on the side. Uh, so it's really important to do sort of a, a double vision about what was really going on. But also, if you notice in the screen on the left, they're actually very near the manufacturing floor. And the guy in the white and blue is holding a piece of equipment that came off the manufacturing floor, not right. And what he has is a phone on just beneath him, but it's an audio connection. And he's trying to describe, like it took him a half an hour to describe exactly what was wrong with this particular piece. No, no, not there, over here. Uh, so you, we all know having either a video or a graphic interface would have been a lot easier for them. Um, and then on the right, they did have video conferencing. Um, and you can notice the guy in the pink shirt was in both of those uh, interactions. And I have lots and lots of stories to tell about of the cultural differences and just the limits of the technology. You can see that if a room has nine people in it, you have to have the camera way back, right? And so everybody's about this big. And you can't sort of, like a TV set, zoom in on somebody when they're talking, etc. So it's just, a, and therefore they shout because the people are so far away. Well, they're not really, the microphones are right here. <laughs> All right, so we've broken the physics of the actual space and have to sort of fix how people are going to interact. 
Another project we were involved in in the 90s it was called the Express Project. This is kind of a strange project. The National Science Foundation decided that rather than uh, chew up a lot of trees with paper submissions of grant proposals, it would be, would be nice if we did it electronically. So they put out the, a call for, for proposals, and um, uh, in the end, they awarded the grant jointly to Carnegie Mellon in Michigan. Uh, and our job was to re do the research that would un uncover what the issues were in, in doing this kind of electronic thing. Uh, one of the, fo the real focus was on uh, developing multimedia documents. These would be documents that had not just text, but pictures, uh, mathematical equations, all kinds of other, other media, uh, as you see more down on the far side. Um, it turns out that Carnegie Mellon and Michigan were developing different systems to do this task, this multi-media multi, uh, documentation. And so NSF set the challenge that uh, one of the goals in the project is to arrange an exchange between the two systems, that you could write a, 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 a document in the Carnegie Mellon system and read it in the Michigan system. Well, there are lots of real technical challenges involved in that. This, this monograph, which came out later, actually describes a lot of those challenges and how they were met. Um, for some reason, well, I know the reason was that um, after a couple, this was supposed to be a three-year project, but after the second year, uh, NSF pulled the plug. And we're told part of it was because the auditors at NSF said, you cannot fund a procurement project under, under the research umbrella. And that was kind of what this was. Um, we thought it was just doing research, but um, from NSF's point of view, they were hoping to get a system out of it. So they pulled the plug. Um, but in the meantime, a lot of things happened. We had, we had a real rich set of interactions with the people at Carnegie Mellon, at both Carnegie Mellon and Michigan. It was uh, people, uh, social scientists and, and uh, computer scientists interacting. And there were actually big institutional ramifications at both places about things that happened later. Eventually, of course, NSF did build their own uh, uh, system on, under a proper procurement model. Uh, and of course, that's the way we do things today. So the 90s, um, the, one of the most influential things in our career was uh, in 1989-90, we did a sabbatical at Rank Xerox Europark in Cambridge, England. And we'll tell you a little more about that in, in a moment. So that was kind of a watershed moment for us in many ways. But uh, we again were, we resumed, after that sabbatical, we resumed uh, our positions at, uh, in psychology and the business school. But also during the 90s, a significant thing happened. A group of us decided to uh, create a new school at Michigan, the School of Information. And we'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. So this is a graphic that really represented what was going on at the time. Jonathan Gruden had this in a paper, and a lot of people picked it up saying, yes, this is what's happening, the change in our field. So on the left-hand side is we started looking at people doing work on mainframes. Right? In fact, one of the first computers that I used, you had to flip the switches. That was programming. Right? So it was hands-on. So it was that, then we had the programmers, then we have individuals at workstations, and then we have groups. Of course, today, it goes many layers beyond that because we have social media that goes everywhere and you know, subgroups uh, doing various kinds of things. So there's, there's a much bigger layer after that. But this is a very famous graphic from the 1990s. One of the spooky things for us is having been there so long, in the field so long, we go to a computer museum, it's like our little historical <laughs> experience. We see all the things we used to work with. So as mentioned, in 1989 and 90, we spent a 12 months actually in Cambridge at uh, the Euro Park, uh, which was a satellite uh, lab of the Xerox Park in Palo Alto. It was sort of funny to have the European Palo Alto Research Center. It was kind of a strange name. Anyway, uh, we made a number of uh, acquaintances then. Paul Durish, <laughs> looked a little different. A little different, yes. Uh, Victoria Bellotti, uh, Bill Gaber, uh, Tom Moran, Elizabeth Churchill, all of whom have gone on to fame and, well, I don't know about fortune, but fame anyway, in the field of well, HCI. Elizabeth was actually finishing her PhD at Cambridge, yeah. and she hung out at, at Ring Xerox. So as you know, Paul is here. Uh, Victoria you. spent most of her career at Xerox Park in, in Palo Alto. Now is at uh, Lyft, I believe. Right. Bill Gaver, uh, he actually got his PhD at UCSD with Don Norman, but then came to Europe and has more or less, more or less stayed in Europe ever since. He's been in, the, in London in the design school. Tom Moran was, after, after being at uh, Xerox, went on to IBM and is now retired. 
And Elizabeth has had a series of jobs in various uh, Silicon Valley companies. Today she's well, sort of a superstar at Google. So this is uh, one of the things we did at Europark. They had a, an amazing uh, audiovisual environment, uh, and it was really living. It was really kind of an interesting experience living in that environment, and uh, you can read about that elsewhere. But we began prototyping some ideas that we had about doing some studies. Uh, we had uh, done a lot of field work before we went to Europark. Uh, looked at uh, people doing software development in companies like Anderson Consulting. And we realized that there were some really weird things happening when people did worked with uh, whiteboard and paper and pencil and so on that, that actually constrained what they did. And so we thought maybe if we gave them some different tools, they would have, it would have some different consequences for the kind of work they did. So we built a, a shared editor called Shred. I'll tell you a little bit about it in a second. And uh, then we began looking at uh, ways we could use Shred in, either in face-to-face -face meetings or in this case in uh, video-mediated meetings. Uh, this is a, actually, we prototyped this in, in Cambridge, but this was set up in, in Ann Arbor, where you've got um, three people working together. There's a shared workspace here, and then they have video and audio things. And we kind of tried to make it kind of directional, so it felt like three of them were sitting around a table. We actually had to flip one of these people's image around so that when they were looking at each other, they actually looked like they were looking at each other. Well, by the way, it looked like they were looking out, out the window or something. But it actually was a very sort of, sort of successful setup. So before we went to your park, we were going to we were designing a nice space that was at the business school. The business school had just built a new building when we moved over there, and if in universities, was the very hardest thing to get space. Space. Right. They had space and they didn't know what to do with it, and I went. I know what to do with it. We'll just build a research lab and a collaboration technology suite, and et cetera, et cetera. So we had this beautiful facility planned. Then Gary and I went to Europe Park, and then the rest of our staff got to build it. All right, this was funds from Sun and Anderson Consulting and Apple and Apple Steelcase. Steelcase, right? But the neat thing about this, uh, this is before laptops, right? So all you had was a clunky desktop. And if you put your desktop on a table where you're in a meeting, then you can't see the people on the other side. So what we did is take that desktop and put lower it into the table. And then it was uh, on a motor so that you could either make it flat because you're not doing anything, or all the way up because you're the person taking notes in the meeting. But most of them kept it down like this, so you could make eye contact with the rest of the people in the room but still do something. Um, and then these, they were called Elmers, and I can't remember what the stands for. Yeah. Uh, you could do it like this, they were movable. And so you could make a circle, you could make rows, you could do whatever you needed to. Uh, this turned out to be the most common um, arrangement. Um, I have to make a comment. Uh, this is me, this is a graduate student whose name I don't remember. This is Poppy McLeod, so he's a researcher in computer and information systems, uh, now at Syracuse. And this is Lou Rosenfeld, who is famous about uh, knowledge uh, organization. He has a big company in, uh, he wrote the book that has the polar bear on the front, if any of you know that one. Okay, that's Lou back in the graduate school days. Okay. So this is the system that we built, to, to, that we did a lot of work with, um, and called Shredded for shared editor. Actually, it's very amusing to walk, drive around Orange County and see these trucks that say Shredded on them. So the idea was to give people a tool that allowed them to, to share their work. So there were shared windows in, that you could set up any number of them. There was a private window where if you want to take your own notes or maybe write something that you're going to then later paste into the shared document. Then we had some tools that would allow you to sort of navigate. You could uh, go and look at where somebody, some specific person was working right now. You could track them, we call it a sticky find, that you would follow them around as they worked in the document. But then you could always go back to where you were before and, and resume whatever you were doing then. And then we had a separate one of these for each of the, we actually, um, this is very much like uh, something, uh, you know, it's a little bit like Google Docs and so on. We actually talked to the Google Docs developers with this, about this and gave them some ideas uh, for uh, modifying Google Docs. So we did a number of studies and were known at the time for measuring everything. Gloria Mark gets the prize now for measuring everything, but back then we had the prize. And so we had actually everything people did, both what they spoke and what they typed and you know, location in the room, all kinds of things. 
And then we developed um, a scheme, a visualization of what were they talking about. So this is talking about the issue, the alternatives, and criteria for evaluating those alternatives, summarizing where we are now, uh, meeting management, project management, and a bunch of other little things. But then we could, the size of the circle is how long you spent doing that, and then the thickness of the arrow is how frequently you went from one to the other. All right, so we had a picture. This is actually Anderson Consulting meeting. And we did a number of meetings, and they all looked the same, right? So about how people were doing design. And then we did a study in our lab where they didn't have shred it, they didn't have any technology, they had just whatever the people here had. And then this is what they did. And what we wanted to make sure of is, does this represent, is this a good task to represent um, what's going on in the real world? So when we monkey around with shred it and video and audio and things like that, whatever conclusions we find can come back to the real world. Okay. Actually, when we, we pilot tested some of this work in Cambridge, we got some developers from a local software company to come in and be our pilot subjects. And when it was all done, we asked them, well, how did it go? And she said, well, this was terrible because it was too much like work. And of course, that was music to our ears. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, at the same time, again, because I was working in the, in the business school, uh, Ford Motor came Ford Motor Company came to me and said they're having an experiment, a real live experiment going on, where they want to find out how much productivity would change if they put all the people on a project in the same room. So it's called radical co-location. They already knew baseline productivity, what Ford Motor Company was at the time, and they compared that to national averages and things like that, but they really wanted to change that. So they ran an experiment where they had six groups uh, of projects of either six to eight people. They put each one in a room, like a fairly large conference room, so they're not all over each other, but they have no other offices. This is it, all right? And so there were six teams like that, and they already knew they're gonna catalog how many lines per code, or, yeah, for, per hour. They already measured that along the way, but they wanted us to come and say, so what's going on in the room? Whatever the change is, what's causing it? And so we did tons of observations over the eight weeks that they were in these rooms. The beauty is that at the end, the productivity doubled. That got their attention. Um, and then they said to us, so what's going on? Well, the big thing is awareness of what everybody else is doing and who's stuck. So we have two uh, pictures here. On the left is scene one, where these three are having a conversation at the whiteboard. These two are having their own conversation, and they overhear these three, and then immediately go up and have a meeting. Right? Instead of calling a meeting and getting or putting everybody on Skype, they had the whiteboard, they already had context coming into it, and they just went up there and did the work. So awareness also about when people should not be interrupted. So when their heads are down, or, or somebody just staring at the computer, you want to go over very gently and say, is everything OK? All right, to help them along. So there's a lot of things going on about awareness in the room and that we think had a lot to do with the doubling the productivity. Also in the 90s, uh, we began studying uh, something that was called collaboratories, which were um, geographically distributed scientific projects, uh, or as um, Bill Wolf would call them, laboratories without walls. And, a number of these projects emerged in the, in the 90s, and uh, I did a lot of work uh, studying them on the, out of the field. At the same time, Judy was doing the kind of uh, corporate work that she has described. So in the late 90s, we put together a, a, a summary of what we were learning from all this field work, and it was later published in 2000 in, in Distance Matters. And um, it was uh, our first attempt to kind of put, figure out why or how these things were all working. Yeah. Um, one collaboratory in particular that we spent a whole decade working on was the, uh, uh, the Upper Atmospheric Research Collaboratory. This is um, uh, upper atmospheric physicists who study the Earth's upper atmosphere and its interactions with the solar wind. Uh, the aurora borealis, or the, the northern and southern lights are one in manifestation of, of what they were studying. But what we did was, um, we, the initial goal was to instrument a bunch of research, a bunch of ground-based facilities in Greenland that a community of researchers were using 
and we made it possible for them to use those facilities in real time from their home uh, base. This, this is before the you, internet. This is, well, no, this was on the internet. The early one was not. Yes, it was. <laughs> Listen to him then. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so we built the software for this. This is a, a, one of the example prototypes. You see the various pieces of data flowing in from various instruments. There's a persistent chat here, which is very important because we have people all the way from Europe to California participating. And since the chat was persistent, if you log in from California when it had been going on for eight hours, you could scroll back and see what, get some context about what was going on with the experiment. Um, this was actually a live video feed from one of the uh, scientists' laboratory. Um, this project went on for 10 years uh, at a million dollars a year, so it's quite amazing. Halfway through, it got kind of reformulated, renamed SPARC for the Space Physics and Aeronomy Research Collaboratory. And one of the things we did then is uh, add in to the mixture not just live feeds from instruments all over the world, but uh, supercomputer model uh, modeling opportunities. And you could do the things like right here. You had the data coming in. This is actually data coming in from a satellite. And then this is supercomputer uh, renderings of the same phenomena. And uh, the, uh, one of our informants, one of our users, said, you know, in the old days, just not right before this, you would get, gather the observations from, from data, and then you would get the supercomputer models like weeks later, and then start looking at the, at the compare the two. This, this is how you look at the two things at the same time. A lot of technical challenges in that, obviously. But he talked about it closing the data <coughs> theory loop. It had a big impact on the field. Um, one of the peculiarities of my experience in Michigan was the psychology department in Michigan had very strong connections with uh, the People's Republic of China. Back in 1980, the American Psychological Association sent a delegation to China uh, because the, all the departments of psychology in China were shut down during the Cultural Revolution and all the psychologists were sent off to farms to work and to do labor. And just in the uh, late, very late 70s, they began one by one opening up these departments again. So we went to kind of welcome them back to the psychological community. So we had very strong connections. And in 1993, I went to Peking University, the psychology department, and taught a course in HCI, a uh, graduate course. And then also we were, had a lot of projects going on with the Institute of Psychology in Beijing. And uh, we did a, a number of studies with uh, colleagues in the Business School of Michigan uh, on uh, US Chinese joint ventures looking at how the management teams worked in those uh, bicultural uh, organizations. Shawan Fu, uh, who later became the director of the Institute of Psychology, did a postdoc with us for two years at, in the early 90s at Michigan. And once again, one of our strong connections with, with China. I also mentioned that one of the things that happened in the 90s was we created a new school. The story is, uh, it's a long story, I actually wrote the history of the school. Um, but uh, Dan Atkins in 1992, who's a computer scientist, was appointed uh, dean of the, at, at the time, the School of Library Science. And but with the mission from the president to take advantage of what was happening in the digital world to kind of enlarge the, the scope of the school. So he invited a bunch of us to meet with him regularly over several years to talk about what we'd actually do. And this resulted in 1996 in us forming the School of Information, which still had library science and archives and so on, but it had HCI, it had information economics, and eventually a whole range of other specializations. This is Dan, the dean, and these were, this is Olivia Frost and me, who were the associate deans for, uh, during that whole period. By the way, in, in 2000, we recruited John King from UC Irvine to come and be uh, the dean of the School of Information. So yes, both of us were in the School of Information, but a lot of things happened during this decade. Uh, Gary, as he said, was the Associate Dean for Research and then Interim Dean for a while before John King came around. Um, I was happy doing research, but then after a while they needed some help in the Dean's Office for the uh, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, and so I took that over. So Gary and I were up to our ears in, in administration and you know getting further away from research. Then on February 5th, 19, or 2007, Gloria Mark called us up. Now this is February. What is Michigan like in February? <laughs> Icing up outside. All right. So she calls us up and says, uh, you guys, we have two endowed chairs. Could you guys ever leave Michigan? I said, pause. Oh. 
pause. We look at each other. We look out the window. We said to Gloria, we can talk. <laughs> and 17 months later, we were here. Because everything that we wanted higher up was here. Right? This is a first-rate department. And in our area, this was the place to be. So besides uh, that monumental move, a number of other things were happening. Uh, as often happens when you have a change of millennium, a lot of people say it's a time for reflection, and a lot of this happened in our field. The HCI consortium I mentioned earlier, we devoted one of our workshops to what, what was coming in the next uh, millennium, and a number of the talks uh, at that um, um, workshop ended up in this volume edited by Jack Carroll. Um, also, in this, around this time, the year 2000, I was at a conference on scientific collaboration run by the National Science Foundation, and Susie Iacona, who is, again, a graduate of this school, uh, was a program manager at NSF, and she said, she was sort of scratching her head and saying, you know, we fund a lot of big projects in science, scientific collaboration. Some of them work, and some of them don't. I wish I understood what differentiated them. And, of course, I was listening, so I went home, and I wrote a grant proposal to Susie, saying, I think we can help you with this. She funded it. That led to the, a project called the Science of Collaboratories, where um, we engaged, we had a series of workshops where we engaged a lot of people who were experienced in, in this area. Uh, and then we conducted a number of field studies of various collaboratories and so on. And one thing we did was we created a database of scientific collabor collaboratories. And I think there were like 700 of them in our database eventually, including some in the humanities. It was actually quite interesting that this idea of working together when you weren't together was something that uh, became more widespread. We put together a report of some of this work in this book published in 2008, and uh, it has a number of case studies that emerged from our Science of Collaboratories project, various discussions about taxonomies and so on. Uh, but then a, a critical chapter, chapter four in this book that uh, Judy took the lead on, uh, was an attempt to try to answer in a systematic way the issue or the questions that Susie Iacona raised. Meanwhile, back in the lab, we just can't get out of the lab. <laughs> All right, so we want to study various kinds of interventions about what long distance collaboration was like and how you could make it so that people who were long distance were not ignored. So a postdoc in our, our lab, Nathan Boss, cr created a serious game called Shape Factory. And that was a tool for us to actually then manipulate a lot of things. In Shape Factory, you are to fill a number of orders that have strings of shapes. Right? You could make them all, but you do them all very expensively. But the other people around you can make each of the shapes more cheaply. So what you'd like to do is buy it from them to fill your orders. So you have to do a lot of communication with people. It turned out there's two makers of each shape, one of whom is in the room with you, and the other is in a room far away. So it turns out five shapes were long distance, and five shapes were in the room. And we just say, go, fill your orders, and then they communicate, make deals with each other about what, how long the, the uh, order was and how much they paid for all of these things. So this is our vehicle to say, so who do they bond with and who do they not? Well, one of the surprises, not a big surprise, was the people in the room bonded with each other. Duh, they're right there. All right, so the easy communication trumped, you know, trying to get even a, a lower price from somebody away. But the other surprising thing is the remote people also developed an inner circle because nobody else is paying attention to them. All right, and so they paid attention to each other. They had no idea about who was where, but there was an in-group there and then an in-group in the room. But then this is a vehicle then for us to try lots of different interventions. All right, but it's very expensive to run this. There's 10 subjects in each group. And you need a bunch of groups before you can say what's happening for a particular condition. Um, and so, you know, that's a lot of people. Next one. All right. The nice thing about coming to UC Irvine is you also had space because this building was just brand new. And we, therefore, got to build our dream lab about running the shape factory. And that's called the HANA lab. We had this thing about Hawaii at the time. So it's called the HANA lab, and it's right around the corner here. And it Over is, yeah, oh, right, to the left. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so here's a room for five people. It actually will hold 10. But here's a meeting in that room. 
these are the five individual rooms, right, where people are, are alone in each one of those. And this is the control room. There's Gary in the control room right there. And he can, he, everything is recorded. Remember, we, we study everything. So keystrokes and, you know, words, all kinds of things. Uh, he can, has recordings of everything to do the data analysis, but he can also run things like saying, all right, now go, or time is up, or you only have five minutes. So you can uh, speak to each one of the people. This is a, a school facility, and so anybody can use this. So if you need to run something, and even a subset of these rooms, all right, talk to Marty. He has the key. Oh, I need a drink first. So. As I mentioned earlier, each one of these studies is really expensive to run. So we said, why don't we explore what's going on in these things by modeling it. So some people in our lab got a hold of something called NetLogo, and they actually simulated what, our, what we thought was going on in the heads of our people. So at the top, we have all the little, all the shapes, right? And some are in the room together, and some are individual. And there's, so there's a delay in communication. Um, and then just we had priorities about who's going to talk to whom, and could simulate the old study that we did. Right, to get the two in-groups. Once we had done that, then we could try all different kinds of things about what similarity there was between the people, what, how long a delay does it have to be before people you know, like the people in the room better, all kinds of things. And if we found a sweet spot, something really interesting or counterintuitive, then that's the next study we would run. Right? Because groups of 10, and you've got 20 groups in this one, and 20 groups, that's a lot of people. Um, but we did a lot of modeling with that. But. This brings us to the, not quite the current decade, well, I guess it's the current decade. It right? is, just <laughs> almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, the big thing that's happened this decade, of course, is we retired, although it's in quotes, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, so one of the things we noticed uh, looking back over our career and also at HCIC, that HCI now had a lot of different methods. Right. We started with experiments, but then we go to anthropology, but now we had trace analysis, we had networking, or net logo, we had um, uh, network analysis, social network analysis, all kinds of things. And so what we did is get the people who were experts in each one of these to write a chapter, but a chapter that had the same format all throughout. So there was a definition of it, and this, here's some good papers on it, and here's how you actually do it, and here's if you want to learn more about it. So each of the chapters is like that. So this is the book. I'm going to bring a couple extra copies down to the reception if you want to thumb through it and see, see what it's like. But it's, uh, it, for me, it's gold mine about you know, people who are knowing a method talking about it. Paul Durish is in there it's about it, right? right? Uh, Jillian <coughs> Hayes is in there in several chapters. Um, but as I say, it goes all the way from ethnography down to trace analysis, so it's quite a broad set. I'll just talk about this quickly. One of the things we did, uh, mostly when we got here, was develop a tool to assess how a collaboration is going. And it was kind of based on all of our earlier work. It's an online survey. People would take it who were involved in a, in a collaboration, and then when they finished the survey, we would automatically generate a report about how things are going, things that were working well, things that were not working well, and so on. And then if we did a project where we had a number of people participate, then we would manually roll up these individual reports into a project level report that we would share with project leadership. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about this very much. This is a short book for managers right, that summarizes what we knew at the time about working together apart. Um, and here, again, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but we uh, now we're looking at collaboration in the small so we have people all on the same Google Doc, developing, you know, writing a paper, doing a proposal, whatever, wanting to know who did what and how did it develop. And so we color-coded all the keystrokes of who did what in the document. And that's the pictures on the right-hand side. There's lots of different strategies that people have that you could actually see because of the color-coding of the, the uh, keystrokes. And then more recently, the first one, you know, you, you, you say, well, where do you get the ideas for this stuff? Well, Gary uh, brought me an article from the Orange County Register about a local hospital that was using telepresence robots. So the doctor is in his or her um, 
office, and yet they are doing medicine somewhere else. And so they're on the robot with video conferencing at the top, can drive around and do rounds with nurses with them. Um, so we studied those for a while, and then uh, because I was working on that, Veronica Newhart, who's in education, was studying telepresence robots for children going to school because they couldn't go to school because they had immune deficiency or cancer treatment or something like that. This is far better than four hours of tutoring a week they'd get from another person, right? Because they get to go to school all day long. They learn how to raise their hand. They learn how to stand in line. They get friends. And so uh, that's an ongoing study, uh, telepresence robots for children. Uh, I was called in to the National Research Council again to, for a big study on team science. This is the output of that. I was on the committee and we called in, I didn't call him in, but somebody else called you in to talk about distance collaboration. And just recently, the new Vice Chancellor for Research at UCI has uh, called all of us here who are doing work on team science, Judy and I plus Maritza Salazar and Dan Stokels, to advise him on how to create a more effective, successful culture for doing team science and collaborative science at UCI. And so we're working with him on a number of specific projects. Um, one kind of, kind of final, almost final comment I want to make is that um, one of the things that's kind of been central in our thinking about our research is that, you know, historically people thought that applied research and uh, basic research were kind of opposite ends of a continuum. But in Donald Stokes wrote a book called Pasteur's Quadrant, where he disagreed with that model. He said, no, no, there are actually two dimensions. There's a dimension about how much you're trying to contribute basic understanding, and there's a dimension about how much you're trying to solve practical problems. So, you know, Niels Bohr, who was interested in the structure of the atom as a problem, would be an example of someone who was sort of doing pure research. Thomas Edison, who was trying to solve all kinds of practical problems, was an example of someone who was high on that dimension. But Pasteur, the kind of poster child of uh, Stokes' book, is someone who was not only trying to solve practical problems for French farmers, but wanted to really understand what, why, the, what was behind all these problems and so on. So he was working at kind of both domains at the same time. I've always felt that kind of the ideal HCI or CSCW researcher aspires to be in Pasteur's quadrant. Some people ask, you know, what in the world is this? Someone who's, who's low on both of them. And there actually is a nice example. Um, back in the 17th century, there were a father-son team, the Tredescans, who just collected stuff. Stones, plant samples, animal bones, all, you know, just anything. Built up this big collection. Uh, it became the foundation for the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford. Now, you may wonder, why is it not the Tredescampian uh, Museum? This guy, Isaiah Ashmole, hoodwinked. Um, the younger Tredescan's widow out of the collection, and then ge generously <laughs> gave it to uh, Oxford with his name, uh, with his name <laughs> attached to it. So anyway, but you know those kind of collections have turned to be very valuable for people because they can go and see you know huge samples of something, certain kind of plants, certain kinds of animal remains, and so on. And so they've been actually very useful. So we want to wrap up pretty quickly. If one of the messages is to get involved to find out who's doing what in the field and then you know, volunteer to do things carefully, you know, one at a time, not get overwhelmed, but to get involved in the, in the community. But, and we both get involved in many ways. Yeah, I have a long list. I was going to read it, but I'm not doing that. Um, uh, this book just came out a few weeks ago, actually. Ben Schneiderman, who has made a career out of photographing the field uh, and has a marvelous uh, archive of photographs going all the way back to the early Kais and so on. He recently put this book together as kind of uh, his version of uh, HCI uh, history. So it's called Encounters with HCI Pioneers, and one of the encounters uh, he documents was with us. Uh, these are some. But, yeah, I want to do this one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I went through Ben's uh, archive and found some interesting pictures, I think. The one on the upper left is me. I don't know how he got it. I'm at home. Right? This is my desk at home, and I'm kind of casually dressed there. And indeed, there's a little sign on my Macintosh, you notice, with a little tiny screen, that says, never stop working. Um, this is the time when we had four kids at home, uh, age 7 to 12. Uh, so I did stop working, except for when I wasn't working with them, I was working on the projects and things like that. But we all got through it just fine.
Uh, on the lower part is my giving a talk. This is an overhead projector. This is Stu Card making notes or shopping lists. I love this picture of Gary because that's what a Minnesotan looks like when he's not so sure he believes what you're talking about. <laughs> this is Gerhard Fisher and Gary's book says, you're just full of beans. All right. And this is us getting the Lifetime of Research Award. Okay, well, that kind of concludes our story. And these are just a, kind of a few general lessons. I'll just mention them really quickly. Um, I really encourage you not to be a monolingual when it comes to methods and to adopt a number of different methods in your research. To really try to occupy a pastor's quadrant to have a broader impact. To work on building your community, whether it's your local organization or the professional societies you're part of. To find good collaborators, because it's very hard to make very much progress all by yourself. Uh, to pay it forward, which is if you see like in our case, we, we had a certain culture for how we ran our, our laboratories. And we've been gratified to see that our students have replicated those policies when they've gone off and established their own laboratories. And of course, be a good mentor because we all need to learn from each other. Thank you very much. Would you like to do one or two before heading down there? Sure, sure. One or two questions? We just wrapped it all up, right? Yes. What's next? What's next? <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing that's next is we, we have worked together since we got married, well, actually from before we got married. And so we've been married to each other and we work together. And that's not something for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Some people say, what? And so uh, we want to write a book about couples who work together. We've created a database of probably over 300 couples and not just academicians, you know, restaurant owners, beauty salon operators, every, you know, all kinds of things. And so that's a project on our, on our list. So if you know of some, write it down on a piece of paper and give yeah. it to us. We're still collecting. But then when you, you say, all right, now we're going to write this book when we're retired. Oh, wait, we are retired. <laughs> so now just carving out time to, and then what we're going to do with all of that. Well, of course, the standard reaction we get when we mention that we have worked together as well being married, people say, I cannot imagine. So. <laughs> There's some that like it and some that yeah. don't. Yeah. Well, I guess we're ready for reception downstairs. Yeah. Thank you very much.